the first question I would have for you is, and this is something that um, Ta-Nehisi Coates mentions, and who has just left the Atlantic, that he took on a certain kind of celebrity, and that kind of impacted his journalism. I mean, he described being at a protest and people taking pictures of him, and he's trying to do his job as a reporter. And I wondered, here you are, um, certainly your celebrity has risen. I think I checked this morning, you have a million Twitter followers. Um, I know you've been like ambushed by TMZ at the airport. <laughs> a few times. <laughs> uh, and how does that affect your journalism and who you are as a journalist? Um, first, uh, thank you all for having me here. I've never been to this conference, which uh, considering what the, uh, all the great writers in here and um, you know, what the thought process is, I'm a little ashamed of. Um, I'm also a little nervous. I've never had my boss do a Q&A with me. Usually, I just talk shit about y'all when y'all not around when I do these on other you know, places. So now it's like, man, I can really you watch what I got. You that tonight at the bar. <laughs> yes, I was like, I gotta, yeah, I was like, now I gotta actually watch what I'm saying. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, it, it, the dynamic has changed a lot for me because of, as you mentioned, the quote unquote celebrity. I may not see myself that way, but you know, clearly my platform and my profile has raised considerably. So when I'm out in public spaces, um, you know, people recognize me, but it's the wide variety of people now because there's a difference when you go from being on a sports platform to suddenly being talked about on NBC and MSNBC and unfortunately Fox and all those other places. Um, and uh, it just increases the level of, of scrutiny. Um, and it, it, there is a part of it that is a little uncomfortable for me. You mentioned TMZ. They caught me twice at the airport. They jumped out on me in, while I was crossing a street in LA. I don't know how they found me. I started to think that maybe they had planted a tracking device on me and I just didn't know it. Um, so yeah, I mean, people um, are coming up and approaching me in a, a totally different way. And it feels a little uncomfortable at times just because how they view me versus how I see myself are kind of different. And you know, people have called me a crusader and a activist, things that are not usually associated with a sports journalist or journalist period. Like most of us don't consider ourselves activists. The journalism is sort of the activism, if you will, because we're there to provide context and um, to make stories make sense and to tell you things that you didn't know. So to be considered uh, an activist is a little weird for me. And it, it feels in many respects like um, a bit of a lie because I, I don't consider myself to be that. And just because I, I may have spoke a certain truth, it was truth with some facts to it. It wasn't just to say it. So, or even if whatever I say, that it's sort of based through information and not necessarily through emotion, even though I may be feeling emotional about that particular topic or any particular topic. So it's just, it's, it's kind of a, I'm in a bit of a weird space <laughs> right now, yeah. So one of the things, and those who are followers of you probably know that you, you know, you started as a writer. Um, but in recent times, of course, you, you know, you've, you, you've hosted, co-hosted His and Hers and Sports Center mm -hmm. and, and even now you're on Sports Nation, highly questionable, around the horn, you're on a lot of television. But how does that inform your writing and, and how does your writing inform the way you talk and think on television? How do you juggle those things? Yeah, it, it is weird. Um, it kind of reminds me of <laughs> Like a lot of people, uh, especially depending on what generation you're from, don't know that LL Cool J used to be a rapper. <laughs> they just know him as a dude from NCIS, right? <laughs> I'm like, you know he used to rap. And so um, I think of sort of myself in that way because before I ever got to ESPN, I had a full print career <laughs> that had nothing to do with television. And uh, you know, I was a sports reporter and a columnist in Raleigh, Detroit, and Orlando, 
ESPN originally hired me to be a writer. They did not hire me to be a television person. I worked at uh, or worked for ESPN.com uh, for a few years before TV started to become a regular part of my job. And, and then I decided to leave writing once I got a full-time television job. And, you know, I, I could have still wrote if I wanted to, but I didn't want to because I felt like I was cheating the game. And by that, I mean, I knew I could not devote the time nor the reporting to writing anymore and do daily television. That just wasn't even feasible. And once I started doing daily TV, mentally, I sort of retired from being a journalist because even though we were a daily sports discussion show, our job was to entertain you. We're not covering anything. Um, yes, we're interviewing athletes and there's a role of journalism happening on our show because we have to use our news, ju news judgment, we're interviewing people, relaying information, but the genesis of the, of the talk show, the dynamic of his and hers was entertainment. And Mike and I used to joke, but we were serious all the time by calling ourselves former journalists once we made the transition fully into television. And that was really out of the respect that we both had for the craft of journalism. So even transitioning uh, into Sports Center being more of a traditional quote unquote anchor, I still didn't necessarily consider myself still a journalist because I wasn't in the trenches anymore. And um, you know, TV is a whole nother level of craziness than what writing is. You know, um, with TV you have to just know a little bit about a lot of things that you, that you don't in writing, but uh, at least at that point in my career as a columnist, I could sort of pick my spots a little bit more. Every day, you gotta care about everything. And the trick is to make yourself care about it when you don't care about 85% of the things that are happening that day. And so I think uh, the writing part allowed me to be a good TV person in the sense that I was able to absorb a lot of information very quickly. Television kind of reminded me of the first time I covered the Olympics, which would have been 04 in Greece, um, where day to day you are covering a different sport, maybe even two or three sports in a day. You may not know everything about that sport. Um, you can go easily from covering gymnastics to beach volleyball to basketball in one day. And that is what doing Sports Center was like. It was a fire drill every day. And so going through that, coming back to writing, I'm so much more chill now as a writer than I was when I left, every story and column I wrote felt like giving birth. Not that I know what that feels like, but I, you know, <laughs> I, I sort of imagine that's what it's like. It's, you're so, um, your personal emotions, you invest so much in every piece. So when you don't get the reaction you want or everything just feels personal in writing. Once I started doing TV and coming back to writing, TV helped me understand it's not all personal. And that's a good thing, I think, for me anyway. And so now, um, I don't live and die with every sentence the way I think I did before. And uh, I think it's helped me, doing television helped me become a, a better writer because I feel like I'm more concise. Because even though, um, you know, we were on TV, you know, the, the scripts that we did, I mean, Mike and I always wrote our own scripts. I never wanted anybody writing anything for me because it would never sound like me. So, um, yeah, it taught me to be more concise, more pinpoint, um, and to really understand and value time. So, um, I didn't expect that, actually. Uh, like most print journalists, I mean, we used to make fun of TV people all the time. <laughs> Having been in TV every day, a lot of it was deserved, <laughs> I can just say. It was a lot of it was definitely deserved. Because we can be some divas <laughs> now. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, television taught me a lot of great lessons that I've been able to kind of, you know, carry over. And um, I, I truly enjoy the fact that I've been, been able to do both to some measure of success. You know, it's interesting that um, I remember when you were, I think this goes back to when you were his and hers even, and trying to get you to write for the undefeated. Mm -hmm. And you, you were reluctant, you, I mean, you wanted to, but there was a little bit of, you know, discomfort with him. I think you, you didn't think that, you know, you were, you were out of practice. Yeah. But, but when you did it, you were really sharp. 
I mean, and and I I just wondered is is talking. There's there's you're you're giving your opinion in concise ways a lot on TV. You got to be fast and be mindful of it, and maybe that helped you get that out. I don't know what the transition is from from talking and in your head to actually sitting down and crafting that as a column. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed writing more because, uh, as you just said, with TV, you do not have the benefit of time. And sometimes, especially if you're talking about, say, the national anthem policy, there are layers to that story that you don't get to uh, in a conversation about it on TV. You might have 60 seconds uh, for an entire segment or 90 seconds, and that's not a lot of time. Whereas when I write about the anthem, I can go through the layers. And... Um, it felt good to kind of just produce some written content that uh, that wasn't that was on a clock in a different way, and to talk to people. And that was the other thing I missed about writing is uh, you, when you're in studio every day, you are further and further removed from the things you're talking about, and yet people are considering you to be the expert, you know. And so, going back to writing means you know making calls, going to interview people in person, and actually getting a personal feel for what I'm actually writing about. And that was a relief uh, because to, you know, there are plenty of stories that you discuss on TV, especially you know, when you're in the talking headspace where you are just throwing shit at the wall. <laughs> I mean, you're trying to sound informed as possible, but the truth is like, you don't really know, you know? I mean, you're guessing and you can make that guess entertaining and present it in a certain way, but you don't really know. And um, going back to writing is where at least you feel so much closer to the answer. Well, I, I was successful get to you back. Uh, Mike Wilbon got some reps at the Undefeated, and he <laughs> yeah. enjoys that. He was a great columnist for a long time, and, and I can see him doing different things. I got LZ Granderson to write, so I, I got to work on, on our buddy, Mike, uh, Mike. Smith. Getting back writing. Um, <laughs> well, as Mike likes to say, um, uh, I like having written more than I like writing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's going to be a tougher sale. <laughs> right. it, it, it's, it, it's also interesting to me anyway that, at least for me, the, the reporters, the, the, the TV analysts that I enjoy the most and seem to be to me, the most informed had print backgrounds. I mean, mm -hmm. like David Aldridge and Rachel Nichols, Mike Wilbon, you know, I could go on, they, they Stephen A. Mm -hmm. they, they, they started either in beat reporting of sports, uh, you know, and, and graduated to columns. And so how do you, what would you say about that, you know, that observation? Yeah, it, it is interesting. Um, I mean, the whole genesis of the show Around the Horn, they're all former columnists, usually. Um, and all, mostly, almost everybody's a former newspaper person. Uh, I think what we were all able to develop when we were print reporters and columnists was authority and credibility in that field. And I remind people of Stephen A. often that, you know, he covered the 76ers, he covered the NBA, he was considered one of the best NBA writers in the country. And so, you know, when he's on, on TV, um, he's also the greatest performer, I think, at ESPN. And I don't say that as like, you know, he's being inauthentic, it's so him. <laughs> but um, yeah, with that background and that credibility, I think there comes a level of, of comfort. And a producer told me once that the reason that he liked columnists that transition into TV is because, you know, People, a lot of people in television, he said, I can't teach them how to have an opinion, but I can teach someone who has an opinion how to do TV. So he always felt like, you know, um, myself, the Rachel Nichols, Stephen A., Mike Smiths, that we already had sort of the foundation in terms of the information, the credibility, authority, and the opinion. And then it was just a matter of getting enough reps on television to actually be good at television. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for whatever reason, it's been uh, a pretty seamless transition for most of us. So, coming out of Sports Center and then joining the Undefeated, uh, now you write a lot more and you're in a 
more of a routine of writing. You see things and you think of the written form. Mm -hmm. um, not that we can't have video mm -hmm. and that going with it, but you're thinking about what am I going to write and, you, and you, you see subjects. So some of the things that you've written about, just to give the audience a, a smattering, include Everything from Luke Cage. Uh, <laughs> Writing about to, myself. Yeah, to, <laughs> Being in Luke Cage. That was you know, what. to the NFL anthem policy. Mm -hmm. uh, you wrote about... Domestic violence. Yeah, right. domestic violence. Rice, You've written yeah. uh, about um, also, um, you know, Colin Kaepernick and being out of the, the NFL, the NFL owners and, and, and their politics. Uh, the Native American mm. lacrosse teams who were expelled for reasons that are murky uh, mm. out of the, the only Dakota lacrosse team league that I think from 11 to high school. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, how do you come to your subjects? What, what sparks, what are you, what are you, how are you coming to these subjects? Um, interest, passion kind of lead me uh, for sure. And it's, again, another thing that I think uh, I've loved about returning to writing is that just being able to focus in. And, uh, you know, for me, it, it depends. I, I don't mind jumping in, in a conversation as in a national conversation like the anth anthem policy would be or starting a conversation. Um, and so I also look at those factors as well. And, you know, uh, to some degree access, really, it's like the thing that I most want to write about, can I get to the principal parties involved and add that to this piece? Um, but I definitely think um, interest and passion, they've sort of got to lead you. Because in order for me to have a, a hot take, <laughs> you know, it's got to be a fire, <laughs> right? So I got to be able to, um, to feel some kind of level of investment into what I'm writing about. So one of those topics was police were summoned to a golf club in Pennsylvania by a white, group of white golfers who thought that the five women, black women golfers, were uh, golfing too slowly. You, you called it the latest example of white fear weaponized. Right. Golfing my black. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, that incident happened, I think it was shortly after the Starbucks incident. And, and obviously, in the wake of that, we've seen a number of these incidents popping up, you know, to the police uh, being called on kids, starting a hot dog stand, just, you know, uh, was it Barbecue Becky in Oakland? Like, all of these, all of these different instances where black people just existed, and that seems to bother a lot of people. And... You know, if you know anything about uh, the history, you know, of the police and that very tenuous relationship they've had with black and brown communities, that it was interesting that it touched the sports world because it gave, you know, sort of us permission or me permission to talk about a wider issue, which is the whole reason why I wanted to be at the Undefeated, is there are these important conversations taking place, you know, in our communities, in our country. And there are so many entry points that sports will give you. And The Undefeated is the only place at ESPN where we can comfortably have those conversations. And so the type of writing I probably like to do now and am more passionate about are the ones that have the connective tissue between, you know, race, sports, culture, politics, all four of those kind of mashed together because they've always been mashed together. So um, that was just an opportunity to talk about something uh, that was happening, you know, in our country that had always existed and always happened. But now we got good old video <laughs> and, and people are continuing to tell on themselves. One of the things that I know black athletes talk about a lot is just how they are seen and and who they are and that they are often off the playing field, people that are not known, you know. Um, and I know you wrote about Aaron Foster, who's one of the 
you know, really smart, thoughtful, former athletes. You wrote that, and this was right before he's releasing a hip hop album, <laughs> you know, latest to do that, but he's also was going back to college for, to get a physics degree. Yep. <laughs> um, and you wrote that so many athletes struggle in retirement financially and emotionally because they haven't truly discovered who they are. Yeah, Arian, the thing that makes him very unique, um, and I should say, it's a good hip hop album. I know that they are, uh, that athletes do not have the best reputation at, at actually producing good hip hop, but his is legit. And uh, the one thing when he was playing, he was always a really you know, thoughtful interview because he had a keen sense of who he, who he is. And he's also somebody who, I, I, I told, I joked with him about this, but I, I meant it like he could have easily been a journalist because he's so curious about everything. So, um, and he's also one of the few athletes who admitted to being an atheist. And so he has this personality that is a potpourri of some of the most interesting things, you know, atheist, um, super interested in physics, thinks he can fight a wolf and win. Um, it's a true story. <laughs> he, will, he will break down how he could beat a wolf's ass. I'm like, dude, it's a wolf. Like, you just, you gotta let it go. <laughs> like, some stuff you just not gonna be able to do. Um, you know, uh, a father, you know, he's so curious about life and is so fascinating. And a lot of times, athletes, when they retire, when they go through either depression, divorce, like all these bad things some happen to them is because they cannot find another passion that it at least is in the same ballpark of the sport they played. They can't do it. And... They don't have a plan. They never think about the day when the sport retires them because very few athletes get to retire on their own terms. And he was somebody who, had a, who knew exactly what he wanted to do as soon as he left football, and for that matter, financially had put himself in a position to do it. Um, as much as I, I think he'd make a great commentator, uh, the fact of the matter is that he has so much of life that he wants to explore. I was just, I think I was looking at one of his IG stores earlier, like he's in Tokyo right now. So he wants to use his money to basically fuel his passions. He has a podcast that's really good that I was on uh, called the Now What uh, Podcast. And, um, you know, he's self-funding all the, he put the album out independently, the podcast, doing all that, because he never, he doesn't want someone else to control you know, what he does and how he does it. So I, I think, you know, despite the fact he's still super young, I see this being his blueprint. I can't wait to see what he does with this physics degree. <laughs> it's like he's gonna try to like be an astronaut next. Like, I don't know what he's gonna do. But uh, I'm, I'm super excited for however many things he has coming up in his future. Who are your favorite writers? Is that the entry point where I have to tell everybody how you were one of my favorite writers, oh, Kevin? No. Come on. That's not a setup. <laughs> you how your Clarence say. Thomas book is one of my favorite books still. Yes. No. But Kevin actually uh, definitely was one of my favorite writers. Um, not as good as his wife, Donna, who <laughs> is sitting right there. She was my favorite columnist in college. Uh, Michael Wilbon was too. Um, I felt like the, whole, the most of the post staff was <laughs> at some point. Uh, but now, let's see now, um, and I'm not just saying this because she was my college roommate, but I, I love reading Kelly. Um, Kelly Carter. Kelly Carter, who's a senior entertainment writer for The Undefeated. Um, the one thing that I do enjoy about social media is that it makes, it, the, lo the list of people I'm now exposed to is, just an infinitely long list of people. Um, let's see, who else? Uh, I'm trying to think of all the sports writers, but, I've, but like regular writers are all coming to mind. Um, I, read a, I, mean, I read a lot probably, lately I've been reading more books. I don't mean to make that sound bad, but like now because I have more time you know, to kind of to kinda read books, like I'm in the middle of reading uh, Phil Knight's book, Shoe Dog, uh, which is interesting. Um, and let me think, who else am I reading now? I feel like I'm reading, a, 
I'll go by publications. I mean, I read Slate, The Atlantic, uh, The New Yorker. Um, probably, I do read The Ringer. Um, they have some really good writers there. Uh, Brian Curtis is a good writer, and I'm not just saying that because he did a profile on me, <laughs> but he generally is a good writer. Um, the Athletic, they, a bunch of, I mean, Marcus Thompson, like is, I could give you a list of like 50 writers I love, I feel like at the Atlantic, but um, in addition to those at ESPN. So, I mean, good writing is good writing, whether it's about politics, nature, sports, news. Um, so I feel like now that I don't have to do a daily sports show, my palate is opening up again so that everything I'm reading is not just about sports, which is good. I think the best sports writers are ones who are very well-rounded. I remember years ago when I worked at the Free Press, uh, Mitch Album, he told me, I think at the time, I think he, 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 that he didn't watch TV, that he only you know, read. And I thought this was fascinating because obviously in sports, I mean, other than live events, um, in sports, you, know, you, you watch TV, you watch a lot of sports content. But you know, that really wasn't his thing, and he was you know, certainly growing up, one of the, the best writers I've, I've ever read. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think if you're in this business, like you have to, being well read is a huge component to that. Why did you take a journalism class in high school? I had a, this is a secret <laughs> question I was uh, wait, told uh, to ask you by uh, a certain person that knows why? you well. Okay, <laughs> I took journalism uh, because I think I had to take personal health. And, um, you know, it, the football coach taught personal health at my school. And I was like, am I really trying to have a sex talk from coach such and such? Like, I'm good. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm good. So it was like that. And journalism it was like, was another uh, uh, elective. And, you know, I knew I loved reading newspapers because in those olden times, you actually had to read them to follow your sports. <laughs> okay. And so... Uh, I used to read the free press and news sports sections pretty much every day or, or whenever I could. And so I took journalism because I was interested in it. I was a big sports fan, knew I wanted to be a writer. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it sort of changed the course you know, of my life because in Detroit, the high school newspapers were actually produced at the professional paper at the free press. So uh, once a month, they had a huge insert in there with a page from every high school that you know had their own high school newspaper so I had to go to a professional newsroom to produce the paper and so the moment um, I walked into a newsroom it was just like a love at first sight thing where uh, you know it was like people were yelling and it was activity and like they were doing all these weird things I didn't understand and more yelling and I was like wow this place is amazing <laughs> so <laughs> So I came down there uh, to the Free Press once a month, and they also had a high school journalism program that they did in the summer where uh, I think it was a six-week program, 20 hours a week. You got paid, which was even better. <laughs> and they took about you know, 12 to 14 high school students from Detroit for this program. So I applied, got it, um, and during that summer, um, and ABJ was in Detroit. It's the last time it was in Detroit, in fact. This was 1992. And so uh, the director of the high school journalism program, she marshaled us down to NABJ, to the convention center, and made us all join. So I joined when I was 16. <laughs> and I heard you had a column called Jamel's Journal at age 17. <laughs> this is true. Who is telling on me, man? <laughs> I gotta find the rat. like the youngest columnist oh, in the country, bro. Oh, God, I gotta find the snitch. Uh, so, after that high school journalism program, I, um, uh, they, I'd heard us, that they were looking for um, somebody to answer phones in the sports department. Uh, and basically, coaches called in the scores, you wrote a little paragraph up, it was in the newspaper, whatever. So I did that my junior and senior year of high school. And so they knew I was you know, going off to Michigan State. So they thought it would be a cool idea to have a freshman, a precocious, you know, burgeoning star in journalism to write a journal about what college life was like. And so I, that, is, that is accurate. 
Yeah. No, yeah. you don't. I, no Man, one has asked me about that in like 20 years. That's, that's why I'm. Yes, here. just don't go look for the columns because I guarantee they suck. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they're fantastic. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm sure you want to hear about my gripping tales of gaining so, the freshman 15. <laughs> so, speaking of Michigan, what was it like? I mean, you have been a big Michigan State supporter. You've been on TV talking about it and, mm -hmm. and close to your alma mater. And then, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, certainly the Larry Nasser, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, con conviction and, and all of the other kind of sexual assault and discussion of that on, uh, around on, on Michigan State's campus and the culpability of various people in power. You went back and wrote, you know, a pretty tough column. What was, what was that like going back at that time and having to write about your alma mater in an unflattering way? Yeah, it was, it was it's sort of two parts to this because when the Outside the Lions piece uh, debuted, it debuted on, on the Six O'Clock Sports Center. Uh, so it was me, Bob Lee, uh, Jeremy Schapp, Mike, uh, and so we, I think we did most of that hour on that piece. And, you know, uh, it, was, it was uncomfortable because of the fact that, you know, once, as I said in my mind, I retired from sort of journalism, uh, that kind of made it an avenue for some of the people I used to cover at Michigan State. Like, we had more personal relationships. Like, I consider Tom Izzo a friend. And, but yet, uh, having seen what happened at Penn State, um, and seeing what was happening at Michigan State, there were no excuses really to be made. And I didn't want to be, as I saw some of the Penn State alumni do, you know, sort of as that was going on, and even afterwards, to be that person trying to go out of my way to make excuses for something inexcusable. And the facts were what they were. And, it, and so when I, it, in terms of timing, it just so happened I was going back to the university to speak on campus, and one of the things that I was really inspired by and impressed with and relieved by as well is that the community itself, the students, the faculty, those people who, uh, even those who live in East Lansing, they were not giving Michigan State any excuses. Like, they, they were not going to uh, sit there and just cape for this university just because. Like, they were uh, embarrassed. Um, they wanted people to be held accountable, leadership to be held accountable. I mean, they wanted justice for the for the survivors, and yeah, it was it was some interesting elements, you know, for me because having not only having gone for the university, it's the the crimes itself that happened, the young women who whose lives were changed, some of them ruined. Uh, and those, who, you know, yet they still survive. And the fact that I'm the daughter of a rape survivor. So all of that was meshed in kind of together. And I wrote the columns. And yeah, I mean, I won't lie to you. When I went back, uh, I also was, you know, going to uh, an MSU basketball game. They were, they were playing Purdue. And I did not get a warm reception from everybody. I'll just say that. And uh, it was sort of the, the buzz in the air was just, that I had somehow betrayed the university by writing a column that essentially said they, they had a lot to answer to. You know, I, I mean, I, and I think that was pretty obvious. So, um, so yeah, that was, you know, I mean, I, one thing I'll say, like Tom Izzo was, was great. He was fine. He and I talked. Um, and I gave him the open invitation, like whenever you're ready to address what some people believe or want to know what your role is on sexual assaults that potentially may have happened with some of your basketball team members, let me know if you want to tell your side of the story. Um, and he's long, known me long enough to know that, uh, you know, I'll be fair, but I won't be forgiving. So. I'll ask a couple more and then we can open it up. Um, what's the favorite interview that you've done and what's the most challenging? You know, uh, 
I think the most challenging ones are when you are, have to do interviews with people who have been written about three million times. You know, that's why one of my favorite profiles I've read in, in recent years is the one Wright Thompson did on Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan's been written about exhaustively, but I thought Wright nailed this piece and showed a, a level of Jordan's humanity I didn't frankly know existed. <laughs> um, but um, so to me, those are always the tough ones. If, some, if someone's like, oh, you got 10 minutes with LeBron. I'm like, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> but you know, that's sort of the, the challenge of it. Probably my favorite interview, I have two that come to mind, but for two very different reasons. Uh, a few years ago, I did a piece on Charles Rogers for Outside the Lines. And <laughs> it was one of those, it's funny, it's not funny, but it's funny moments, <laughs> is when you know we were talking about his drug problems, because at that point, I think he had been suspended for the year. Uh, no, I think he was already done with the Lions, and he was attempting an NFL comeback. And I asked him essentially a question about like how bad was your drug use? Uh, and I think he, you know, he smoked marijuana quite frequently. And he looked into the camera and he was like, "I blew, I blew every day watching Sports Center." <laughs> and it was like, really? It was just funny as hell, like, like a lie. You can look it up on YouTube, it's like hilarious. And, and uh, you know, so that was, um, that was funny, that comes, that comes to mind. And early in my career, uh, when I was a reporter at the News Observer in Raleigh, I did a story on the Citadel's first female athlete, uh, Mandy Garcia. And I actually won a, 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 the state press award for uh, best feature for it. And A, going to the Citadel, which I'd never been to, which is a very interesting environment. And this was, it was a few years removed from, I believe it was Shannon Faulkner, or, uh, when they let the first woman into the Citadel. But for her to be the first female athlete, and I was there when she was going through some of what they call knob training, which is essentially newbies, they put them through what is a combination of a triathlon and a Tough Mudder race. Like, it is crazy. So I got to watch all this up close, and um, I was just super impressed by her strength, her resolve, and she fit into that category of somebody who was sort of a, a unwilling and unknown kind of hero, you know? And she, she had military parents. Uh, she was very focused. You know, she didn't want to be some kind of celebrity, but uh, I had a lot of fun, you know, definitely interviewing her. So you didn't say which was your difficult, the most difficult. Oh, I didn't? Um, most difficult interview that I've done? Uh, oh, <laughs> again, um, probably uh, funny, not funny, but um, so we had Manny Pacquiao on, <laughs> and he was terrible. Like, I just, I mean, he was awful. There is, there was, Mike and I were trying our hardest <laughs> to get something out of him. And the interview was so bad <laughs> that we, we punted on it early. And this is during, we're doing live TV. And we joked about how awful he was the rest of the show. <laughs> like we would talk about somebody be like, yeah, he's no Manny Pacquiao, but you know. <laughs> 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 Which you probably shouldn't do. You probably shouldn't make fun of your interview subjects like after you've gotten them off the <laughs> he, He's not coming to talk to you again. Yeah, and I'm just guessing, man, he probably ain't feeling me, right? So. <laughs> Um, but that's, I mean, honestly, that's a, that's a lesson for you, some of you that might want to do TV, is that it, I, I, the mistakes are what make for great television. And, you know, it's the imperfections, the flaws, the moments, you know, those are the moments that make sort of your TV career stand out or how you develop your personality on TV, is that, you know, the more that you, the, the better you get, at being yourself on TV only comes through reps. That's how you do it. And some of the funniest moments we had on his and hers from, you know, Mike cussing on air <laughs> to all those made for the best moments. And so that, that Manny Pacquiao interview, like we were laughing so hard about how bad that interview was. I had tears coming out of my eyes on national TV. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> Never show that one to an interview class, that's for sure. <laughs> all right, we can take some questions. <laughs> you don't get to ask a question. <laughs> Hi. Um, so in such a male-dominated kind of field, um, how do you rise above the adversity? And um, what advice do you have for young 
black women um, who are aspiring writers and journalists like myself, um, and staying confident and bold in journalism? Well, um, you know, I think probably for the, <laughs> there's probably not a lot of industries that women go into that aren't probably male dominated uh, to some degree. Um, but sports is a unique, a unique place because it's sort of built around masculinity and masculine ideas. Uh, for me, I was very lucky and fortunate because I had female mentors early on who gave me a sense of belonging. And I think it's really important if you come into this business that you come in with the mentality that you belong here just as much as anybody else does. The other thing uh, I think that is important is you know, know what you don't know and be okay with that. I think a lot of women come into the business thinking they need to know everything about sports, every single stat, every historical thing that ever happened when pretty much nine times out of 10, your male colleagues do not know that, <laughs> all right? Um, so, and certainly, you know, you wanna be prepared and um, you want to, you know, you wanna be prepared for sure, but don't make it, you don't have to be perfect, you know? And so I think, Certainly knowing and seeing other women of color provides some level of, of inspiration. But providing some level of inspiration is one thing, but you know, don't feel put pressure on yourself that you have to exactly be that person. So you know, sometimes uh, when young women say, oh, I, I wanna be just like you, mm -mm, you wanna be better than me. <laughs> All right, not just like me, better than me. There's already one me. I'm the only Jamel Hill. There's only one you. So that's the thing you have totally going for you, and that's enough. Oh. <laughs> Push it. Up there. Oh. Hi. Got one over here. <laughs> yeah. Just got it right. Yeah. Hi. Enjoyed your uh, talk today. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. What's the biggest lesson you learned um, in transferring from? Uh, uh, TV to back to writing? Uh, wow. Um, you know, I, I feel like uh, the lessons that I learned in TV, you know, sort of made this transition a, a little seamless. One thing I think um, that sometimes when you're a writer, you can get talked out of is your own ownership over your content. And I think in television, because uh, not that writing is not shark infested waters, it's just in a different way. But TV is so shark infested that it teaches you to be bolder and probably more aggressive. Um, good traits for a journalist to have anyway. But I think I learned that there in that medium in particular and I'm now taking it to this you know, arena. Whereas maybe certain things I wouldn't have been afraid I would have been afraid to ask for from a subject. I don't think I have that, that fear now. Or, you know, if I get uh, pitched, you know, somebody, uh, you know, that's, I guess, a, a, a high profile person, you know, if I can't ask them the things that need to be asked just to be journalistically responsible, I'm just not doing the interview. And so I, don't, I think before I would have felt more pressed about like, oh, you know, I should probably, compromise in these terms, but I don't feel that need to, to compromise anymore. So I think, you know, learning to be even more bolder and more aggressive from television is really helpful now that I'm coming back to writing the second time around. Um, now that you have reached kind of this level of notoriety where you're no longer just Jamel Hill columnist, you're the TMZ target, you're all that, you know. <laughs> Resident trouble maker. Yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you feel like you have more or less freedom than you did before you were well known? Because like now any story, even if it's just a reporting on how the football game played out, you know, your, your tagline or your byline of, you know, Jamel Hill now that carries in a little extra something. Do, do you feel that burden now when you, as going back to writing or do, do you feel like you have more or less freedom than you did before you were 
known. When you could yeah. go to a bar, nobody knew who you were, as opposed to everybody's like, Psst, look at that face. You know, <laughs> well, Kevin, why don't you guys say that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> How much freedom do I have? No. Um, you know, uh, I would say I have more scrutiny, which is different. And, uh, you know, to the point where I, I had to Google alert myself <laughs> because, uh, you know, it would just, these stories would pop up where I could say something completely inane or I think to be inane or benign and I look up and it's, you know, a, a, an entire segment on, on a network. And so that feel, that's the part that feels strange to me. And it, it makes me want to be even more vigilant about being careful about what I say. But to some degree, I also realize that the people who sometimes misunderstand you is because they want to. And that I can't uh, explain myself any better if you're intent on always doing that. So I try not to let it impact and affect who I am and what I say, I mean, when I'm writing a column, I'm not thinking about how it's gonna be perceived or you know, they're gonna say this about me now, like I don't care. Um, and I think as a, a columnist, you, you, know, you have to be fearless, otherwise you lose sort of the best thing about what you're bringing to the column. It has to be a sense of fearlessness, not recklessness, fearlessness, which are, which are different for me. So um, I think for a while, I felt like a, a walking think tank piece. Like, everybody, were, they would think peace in the hell out of me <laughs> for a while. And that was, you know, uncomfortable to say the least. Um, but I, I guess I've just learned to just live with the, with the scrutiny. Um, and a lot of times it provides really great co comedy. Like, <laughs> me and my boyfriend, we were, <laughs> somebody sent me a story. And, because uh, I purposely, I don't know how many people in here watch Sex in the City, right? So I was a big Sex in the City fan. And so as everybody knows, you know, Mr. Big, it wasn't until like late in the series or even maybe in the movie that they actually revealed what his name was. So we have this running joke, that my boyfriend, I never refer to his full name. I was like, yeah, you're like the black Mr. Big. He didn't get that reference because he didn't watch Sex in the City. But so my, my co-host nicknamed him old boy. Anyway, long-winded way of saying, we were, um, it was a story about my uh, relationship with him, and the headline was something like, Jamel Hill with hunky boyfriend. It was like, what? <laughs> I was like, have I reached the point where people actually care about my love life? This is hysterical. So I <laughs> sent him this story, and so now his nickname is hunky boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so like, some of it you just, is, is so ridiculous, you just kinda gotta laugh about it. Um, but yeah, I just, I just have learned to live with it. It's fine. <laughs> so I have a question. Um, why do you think uh, so much about race reporting is seen as opinion related when it's perhaps you know, some of the most important narratives that we should be writing when we look at the data behind housing, mm -hmm. schools, um, wealth gaps? I could go on, but it's a little depressing. <laughs> but it seems like we reserve race writing for the opinion section or as columns? Why do you think that is? Well, I, I do think, um, it's funny you brought up the wealth gap because the Atlantic just did a piece about uh, the wealth gap and how it would essentially take two centuries to close it um, based off some, as you said, data, like not emotion, data. I think generally what happens just with all race reporting, the reason why it can be received divisively regardless of how many facts are in there is that people internalize racial discussions. Um, they're defensive about them because if they think about the system as a whole and you know institutional racism, you'd also have to admit you were complicit and nobody wants to do that. Nobody's gonna call themselves a racist. Even some of the most racist, I bet a, a, somebody who was in the KKK would not call themselves a racist. Seriously, like they wouldn't. Like nobody wants that label of being a racist. And so uh, as a result, I think some of the reaction to the reporting is, oh yeah, I know racism is happening. I know it exists, but they're uncomfortable with addressing where it exists. So whenever I hear people say like, oh, I know it exists. It just isn't, this, this isn't the time or this isn't the case where it exists. Well, I'm like, okay, well, where does it exist? Why don't you tell me? And then they're like, what? I'm like, well, if it exists, and you know it exists, 
where is it? It's not just mythically in the air. It has to exist somewhere and be perpetuated somehow. So I, I think that's the challenge of, of having not only reporting and uh, opining on race, but just having racial conversations is that I think nobody just wants to admit uh, where they may have played a part in, in this system. It, it's tough for anybody, I guess, to face. <laughs> oh, All right, we got a wrap queue. They got one more. Hold up. One right. more. One more. I feel so sorry for the one more people because they feel like this better be the most important question in the history of questions. <laughs> I, I was just going to say thanks for being here, so that's it. <laughs> no, um, I, I really am joking. Uh, I actually have a question. Uh, what, what, Talk about a little bit, a little bit about the challenges that you faced going from being a writer to on television, and uh, I know a lot of us as writers were making the transition to things like podcasts, maybe not television, but mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give to those of us who are making those that transition um, into kind of murky waters where we we <laughs> don't know where we're going? Well, um, a couple things. Um, one, you only get better with reps, all right? So the more times you do it, the better you'll get at it. Sort of like a 10,000 hour thing, but I just noticed the more television I did, and especially different types of television, the more comfortable I became. I think what really helped me probably in the early stages of my television transition is that um, I didn't take TV real seriously, as in, you know, I took it, I realized it was, you know, a serious industry, but I didn't take myself that seriously on tel television. Uh, Self-deprecation works, and I think you can have the mindset that you have to be perfect every single time out. That's how you put so much pressure on yourself. And the beauty is in the mistakes, you know. Uh, I think people at home appreciate somebody, you know, if I flub somebody's name, you know, I may make a joke about it. Like we used to, um, <laughs> there were times, you know, the thing with these, some of these amateur videos, like every now and again, we get some crazy amateur video from, from a foreign country, could not pronounce any of the names. I wasn't even gonna try, so we would be on TV. Um, and uh, you know, there, the video would pop up, and we'd be like, yeah, old boy and old girl there. <laughs> like we just, and the audience knew what we were doing. I was like, folks, that's because we can't pronounce these names. So we just own the fact we couldn't pronounce it on TV. And people appreciate, whether it be a podcast, um, you know, something digital you're doing, television, they appreciate when you own the mistake because you can, trust me, you can turn that, you know, into a moment um, really easily. I mean, I had a dog biscuit on TV, <laughs> which is, Was it good? you know what, they're very bland. I don't know why dogs like these things. They're bland and you need water with them, like they're very dry. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> I also ate a whole egg, but you know, whatever. We won't get into that. But no, be and and be be yourself. You know, I know that seems like weird advice because you're like, well, who else would I be? But there's a lot of times people get on television and you know feel the need to be stiff or you know whatever 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 it is that makes your personality unique. Don't be afraid to bring that to TV, you know, or to a podcast. All right, I think that was her last question. <laughs> Thank you all.